All right, now Romans chapter 10, of course, is a very famous soul winning chapter where, where it's talking about whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what we're going to be talking about this, or this evening is salvation. Now, um, I actually had somebody email me a question, and I've been wanting to kind of preach an eternal security type of a message anyways for a while. I've been wanting to, to do this, and this kind of just helped prompt me to, to preach this sermon tonight. And first we're going to just go over some real basics, um, real basic method for, for determining what we believe, just in doctrine in general, and especially about salvation. You know, how are we going to understand what the Bible says and analyzing any doctrine that you hear? And this is real simple, real, real straightforward. It just kind of makes sense because... Um, number one, when you, when you hear something, first of all, you got to be saved for the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. I mean, that's, that's like the foundation. That's the groundwork. No one that's unsaved is going to understand Scripture. They're not going to understand the Bible. Their eyes are blinded. They don't know. Um, the, the Bible is a spiritually understood book. You need to have the Holy Spirit to help you to understand the words of God. You have to be saved. That's, that's number one. So if you're not even saved, you're not going to be able to understand the Bible. And that's, you know, honestly, that's where this false doctrine, all, most of it just stems from anyways. It's from people who aren't even saved trying to understand the Bible and coming up with these doctrines that aren't real, they don't exist, that they've just, they've come up with this stuff out of their own heart because they're not saved, because they're not being guided into all truth. But number two, okay, we need to make sure that our our, our Doctrine is coming from the King James Bible. It has to be coming from God's actual words. This is where we, this is the true source of our doctrine. So you need to, to, to believe that the King James Bible is God's word and that it's without error. As soon as you start introducing or, or believing that, well, there's errors in the Bible, there's errors in this, there's errors in that, you could come up with any doctrine that you want. Because all you have to do to, 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 throw away a doctrine and just say, well, that's an error. That's not what the Bible is really saying right there. It's really something else. They got that wrong. And you can apply that to just about anything when, you, you know, when, you, when it boils down to it. If you don't have God's real words, if you don't know what God said, then who's to stop you from, from coming up with, with whatever doctrine you want or, or believing any doctrine you want? You have to understand that the King James is the word, God's word. And I'm not going to prove that tonight, but this is just, you know, I'm laying down the foundation on things that you need the prerequisites for just determining what doctrine is right. Um, everyone that's here tonight, I know, is already, um, as far as I could, as far as I know, fits one and two. Number three, and I mentioned this before, when we're when we're trying to understand if a doctrine is correct, we need to be able to list the clear statements that are in support of that doctrine. There has to be some clear statements to prove whatever doc, whatever major doctrine that you're trying to prove. I mean, whether it be the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus Christ was without sin, you know, salvation by grace through faith, all of these different core document, core doctrines and, and fundamentals of the faith that we believe, there needs to be some clear statements in the Bible that just pretty explicitly say whatever it is that you're believing. Um, and we need to be able to differentiate between clear statements and parables. Oftentimes, these false doctrines are a result of in, uh, um, people trying to take a parable and apply it to mean whatever it is that they want it to mean. And it's easier to do that with a parable than it is with a clear statement. Um, I went over this quite a bit in John 15 last Wednesday, so if you want, I would recommend going back and listening to that if you missed that, but um, talking about the difference between parables, because John 15 has the, the parable of Jesus and the vine and bearing fruit and how people misapply that. We're going to get into that a little bit tonight, but I don't want to re-preach that since we did already last Wednesday. Um, number four, do any of the clear statements that you found to support whatever doctrine you're analyzing, do they contradict other clear statements in the Bible? Right? So if you find, say, okay, this looks like a clear statement from the Bible and it's clearly saying, you know, that, that Jesus, that, that Mary was a virgin when, when Jesus Christ was born. If you were to find another very clear statement that was to say that, no, you know, Jesus, that Mary was not a virgin when Jesus Christ was born, 
Well, you've got a problem. Either one, you have the wrong Bible. You've got to go back to step number two and get yourself a King James. Or you're not understanding something right. Because God does not contradict himself. God is not the author of confusion. God is not going to have things that contradict himself. So you're obviously not, not reading something right. Now, to have clear statements contradicting each other shouldn't ever happen. That would be a pretty gross understanding of, a, of what we're considering a clear statement to have contradictory clear statements. That shouldn't happen at all. You're, you're definitely misunderstanding something or you definitely have the wrong Bible. Then number five, you've got you to gotta think about what are the implications of the doctrine and follow it through to its logical end and think about all the aspects of what am I really saying here. So when someone says, you know, for example, with, because we're covering salvation, if someone says, well, no, you can lose your salvation, right? You'll have to see, well, what are the clear statements for that? Clear statements in the Bible just say you can lose your salvation. Can you find any, right? And if you can, is that just in direct contradiction to other things that we've seen about eternal life or everlasting life? It says, well, this lasts forever, right? Um, obviously, a contradiction isn't going to work. But listen, you know, when, you, when you're taking a doctrine to, to its logical end, you're thinking, okay, well, let's just say, for example, we can lose our salvation. Well, how, how do we do that? And... and what would be a case, what's a scenario where we can lose our salvation? That's why I like talk, asking that question to people at the door because it has to get you thinking on, the, on that path. Let's, let's just assume that you're right. Let's say we can lose our salvation. Assume it's right. Well, what does that imply then? What, is, what are the implications of that? Okay, well, then how? How do we lose our salvation? You're going to have to be able to prove that from Scripture as well. What would we have to do? Okay, if you're going to list off some sin and say, well, if you murder somebody, then you lose your salvation. Then you have to go back and say, well, when the Bible says here that it's not, you know, to him that worketh not, but believeth that him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now all of a sudden you got yourself a con contradiction. You see what I mean? Like maybe, maybe you're, you're looking at a doctrine and you can't find the clear statements, but you're like, well, maybe it's still true. You start thinking it all the way through. What are all the implications of this? When you start contradicting other, other doctrines that are very solid, um, solidly and clearly found in the Bible, then you've got a false doctrine. And then you get to look at all of the supporting evidence and analyze it in context to see if it truly is supporting the doctrine. So if you start passing the tests, right, and start saying, okay, this doctrine looks pretty good. It's got clear statements. It's not contradicting other clear statements. We, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it and it, and, it, and it makes sense. It doesn't seem to be, to be, um, contradicting anything else, then you can start looking at, okay, well, what are all the su supporting evidence for this? Look at parables, look at other things. Is this truth, you know, fleshed out and does it seem, seem legitimate and true? And, you know, if you could pass all those tests and, and say, okay, this, this looks legitimate, it should be fine, then it would be pretty safe to say that you've, you've got yourself a good doctrine. Um, anyways, these are all different things that you can do to, to analyze the doctrines that you believe. And that's why you'll always find, because... The Bible has to, has to fit together appropriately. I mean, it, it has to mesh. You can't have contradictions, otherwise it's not God's word, as we mentioned earlier. And that's why when you'll find these false doctrines, it's never just one. So, for example, the pre-trib rapture, it's never, people don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, but then are not either dispensationalist or Zionist. Like, those are, those are all doctrines that just go hand in hand. In order to make that one doctrine fit, you have, to, you have to start tweaking and twisting other doctrines and start saying, oh, well, in order for it to be a pre-trib rapture, then when it says the elect here, that can't be talking about Christians, that's talking about Jews. So then you start going into the Zionism route of, oh, well, the elect, that's God's chosen people who aren't Christians and all this other stuff, and see how it starts affecting other doctrine. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense because there's clear scripture that would prove it to be false. And then they also bring up dispensationalism and say, oh, well, that's in a different dispensation. In the end times, they're saved by works and all this other nonsense. And, they, and they, you know, in order to make their doctrine fit, it has an impact and it goes out and affects a lot of other doctrines. Um, it's in, in their attempt to make it merge and fit in with, with Scripture. Um, so just, just be aware of that. But this evening, what I really want to what I really want to focus on is lordship salvation. This is a doctrine that's gotten popular lately with the John MacArthur crowds and the, um, 
what's that other heretic's name? Um, Paul Washer. You know, these people who believe that you have to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life in order to be saved. Meaning that you, in, in order for a person to be saved, they have to recognize and submit themselves unto Christ's authority as in if Jesus Christ says jump, I'm going to say how high on the way up of, of that level of obedience in order to be saved. That that is what is required. That, that subjugation of, of just saying that like it's not enough to just completely put your faith and trust on Him to save your soul. You have to be willing to, to stop all of your sins and to do everything that's right. And, that's the, and it's, it's really a repent of your sins type of message, which is a core part of their doctrine. Now, what I have is I went to this website. It is great. It's a grace to you. I, I was trying to find like John MacArthur's official stuff because he's real popular. I talk to people all the time. They've got the John MacArthur study Bible and all this other stuff. And the guy's a heretic out of hell. Okay, and I don't want anyone to get deceived by this stuff. And one of the, the emails I received was along these lines of a, of a lordship salvation. And when you're listening to these false prophets, that's why there's so many people that are confused about salvation. It's the devil's work using these false prophets to confuse people. What they do is, and it, this happens very frequently, is because I've listened to a, I preached a sermon. Uh, beware of false prophets back, I don't know, in February or something like that. And when I was studying for that sermon, I, I went and I just kind of checked out a few of these guys because I never listened, I never got into any of these heretics before. And then, you know, they get viral videos or whatever. So then you click on it, okay, what's this all about? And you realize right away, yeah, this guy is, this guy is a false prophet. He's teaching another gospel. And they need to be accursed. If you want to know why I say that John MacArthur is a heretic out of hell, it's because the Bible says in Galatians chapter number one that if any man bring any other gospel, I'm, gonna, I'm, you know, I'm not even going to quote it because it says very simply in verse six, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, which is exactly what John MacArthur does. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. These false prophets need to be accursed because they're bringing another gospel. And their gospel is a works-based salvation. And they'll try to tell you, no, 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 we believe that salvation's by grace. It's not of your works. But in everything that they say, it's works. It's defined in the Bible as works. I'm going to prove that to you. So I got all these different quotes and they have this whole thing on like describing their lordship salvation and what it means to believe in Lord. They don't even like, they don't even look at the term as a negative term. They embrace it. The same way that we would embrace easy believism and they use that term as a derogatory term towards us. You know, I look at lordship salvation and that's a derogatory term that, you know, do you believe in lordship salvation? But they, they embrace it. They, they explain, and they explain that here. And um, there's no way I'm going to get through all of this stuff, and I don't even care, because once I start getting into this, I'm just going to get whatever I have time to do is what we're going to get through. But, um, and everything else, then whatever. But this should be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. One of the questions I got, though, in an email, and I want to address this first, before I really get into this Lordship Salvation stuff, was... And it was a good question. And he, and he asked the question, and this is where he's coming from. You look at like John chapter 3. Okay, in John 3, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So there it says, whosoever believeth. And over and over again throughout the Scripture, you're going to find present tense. Right? Present tense of verbs. Whosoever believeth in him. So, okay, that's a present tense. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So where, where they're going with this is saying, well, it's a present tense, so you have to continue believing right, all the way through until you die. That You have to maintain that faith, and it has to just continue, 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 because otherwise then this wouldn't be true. It says, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. So if you stop believing later, it's saying that you're not going to see life. 
So you can see where they come up with a logic. I'm saying it's not it's not a bad um, thought process, right? It's someone who's, who's looking at this analytically and trying to trying to understand, and explain it. Well, one of the things you got to understand with the Bible, just in general, you read the Bible cover to cover, especially in the New Testament, it's written all in a in a in a present tense active verbs like when it's when it's telling you the stories and when it, when it's going through the language that it's written in is is all like present tense right so when you come up with something like this and you say okay well first of all let's just look at John 3:36 he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life what does that mean if you believe on Christ you have hath is present tense right and believeth this present tense, you believe on Jesus, you have everlasting life. Well, how long is everlasting? It's forever. Right? And we go through this oftentimes with people at the door and just try to explain it. Everlasting means forever. If you stop believing on Jesus, and according to this verse, it says, And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If a person stops believing on Jesus later on, just doesn't believe on him anymore. And because this verse says this, they go to hell. Did they ever have everlasting life? I would say no, because it didn't last forever. By definition, everlasting means everlasting. It means forever. So there's one thing. Now, I wouldn't expect you just to just say, oh, okay, well, that's good, and, and never look at it again. But there's lots of other scriptures. John chapter 5, verse 24 for example, says, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. So again, present tense, you believe, you have it, you have everlasting life. But look what he says. He says, and shall not come into condemnation. Now he's using more of a future tense saying, you shall not come into condemnation, but is past, past tense now, from death unto life. So here we get three verb tenses being used in one scripture where he's saying, you have already passed from death unto life, signifying that this is a one-time event that happens. You pass from death unto life. You shall not come into condemnation. He doesn't put any qualifiers on that statement. He doesn't say, well, but if you stop believing, you will. He says, you shall not. And there's no extra qualifications to that. And there's many others, there's many other scriptures that do the same thing, but John 5.24 is a very powerful verse to explain the eternal security of the believer, that once you believe, you've received the free gift. You're born again. I mean, you could go into so many scriptures about being born again. And, um, and, and plenty of others in John 3, he says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So when you're born, how many times, how many births do you have? It wouldn't make any sense to think, well, you have multiple spiritual births. Let's say I'm born and again and again and again and again and again. But if you're saying if someone were to stop believing, could they be saved again after that? By believing. Could you just keep on switching back and forth? You, know, you have to start asking yourself these questions when you're, when you're analyzing a doctrine. How does that work? And really with the, with the mountain of evidence pertaining to eternal life, everlasting life, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. You know, it's a promise from God. It's eternal life. It means it's forever. God can't lie. He's not going to go back on his word. And there are no conditions anywhere in the Bible that say, well, unless you do this, right? If you're saved, you're going to go to hell. No examples of anyone being saved and losing their salvation doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. Um, so there's really a lack of evidence to believe that. And when, and when you actually just, just study the way that the Bible's written and the words that are actually used, it's an active present tense writing and translation of God's word that, it, that the whole book is, is really written in, in a, this is happening right now. Even what you, I mean, we're reading about events that happened a long time ago, and these events were written down after the events actually happened, but they still use words like, and the disciples come to him and say. It doesn't say the disciples came to him and said in a recount of what actually happened in, you know, as a historical reference. It's written in the, in the present, in the here, in the now. And I believe that's also important to understand because it's, you know, when you're, when you're preaching the gospel to people who need to be saved, 
they don't already believe, it's saying, hey, look, you just need to believe. You need to do it now. It's a present tense type of a thing. But anyways, I wanted to kind of cover that first. The rest of this scripture should hopefully help um, address some of this as well. But I'm going to read to you some of what's written on their website and just kind of refute it. And we'll just go through this for until we run out of time. Okay. I promise I won't go through all of my notes on this because it's a lot. And I start going through and it's so easy to disprove what they're claiming. And okay. And here's another thing. Be careful because when you read books, when you read commentaries, when you read even doctrines, whatever you're reading, often what people usually do is they'll put a little scripture reference that says, and, or they'll put a few of them or whatever, this is why we believe what we believe. So they'll write a statement and they'll put their references that they're referencing there. Don't ever, if, you, if you're really interested, if you're going to read this stuff, don't ever just accept that and say, oh yeah, there's their proof. Right? It's like someone writing a, a, you know, a research paper or something, then they just have this bibliography and just say, oh, well, this must be true because they just have all these, these, these sources listed here. How good are those sources? Do you really know if, if you know, are they, are they sourcing Dr. Seuss and you just look at this list and be like, oh, okay, yeah, well, they got a big list. They must have done their homework. Is it legitimate? Is what they're quoting, is what they're saying true? So when you're looking at the doctrines, which is exactly what I did, they would, they would make a statement and then just in parentheses say these are the scriptures, why we believe this. So I look them up and the majority of times, you know, when you read them in context, it's not really what they're talking about. You can see what, what it's really saying or it's just not saying that at all. And they're just using that as a reference. It's, it's funny. We'll, we'll get into that. Well, the first one, the first quote that I saw, and I don't have the whole web. I could get it later if you're interested in it. I, I don't recommend looking at it, but I'm just using this as a, as, a, as a platform to expose lordship salvation because it's a wicked doctrine. A lot of people are deceived by it. So this website says, The gospel that Jesus proclaimed was a call to discipleship, a call to follow him in submissive obedience not just a plea to make a decision or pray a prayer. This is their claim. This is, and this is talking about salvation, right? So this is what they believe about salvation, that the gospel is really a call to discipleship, that that is what the gospel is. I thought the gospel was a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it's the good news, that it's, you know, obviously Jesus wants us to be his disciples. I'm not disputing that, but they'll take these, these thoughts and ideas and just kind of twist them and make them to mean something they don't. The, what they're doing here essentially is equating um, getting saved with being a disciple. Now, again, I covered this in my sermon on John chapter 15, so I'm not going to go through all that again, where I made it very clear that being a disciple is not the same as being saved. But I'm going to reread the scripture that I read in John 15 from Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, 26, Jesus Christ is defining what a disciple is. So they're saying here that the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was a call to discipleship, that that's his gospel. Here's Jesus' call to discipleship. Luke 14, 26 says, If any man come to me and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 33 says, So likewise, whosoever he be of, of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So, right away, according to Lordship Salvation, according to what these people are saying, in order, believing the gospel requires you to hate your father and mother, wife and children, and being willing, and, and not even, it doesn't say being willing. It says um, forsaking all that you have and bearing your cross. You have to bear the cross, you have to forsake all that you have, and you have to hate all of your family and your own life also, or else you can't be saved. That's what they're saying. That's what they're saying is salvation. That's what they're saying is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's how Jesus de defines a disciple. Now, is it a good thing to be a disciple? Yes. Is it a good thing to, to give up all that you have and to follow Jesus Christ and just do everything He wants you to do? Yes. But if that's, what's, if that's salvation, how many people are saved? All those people, what about all those people that follow Jesus? What about when Jesus Christ was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and everybody forsook Him and fled? Does that mean that even His apostles weren't saved? 
That means at that point, nobody was saved, right? Because they all forsook him. He had nobody following him when he got arrested. They all went somewhere else. Is that, I mean, is that, does that sound legitimate to you? They go on to say this, and, and, and they're, they're, they're trying to battle easy believism. They're trying to, to battle the belief that you just need to put your faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. And they try redefining believing and redefining faith into being a disciple, which is exactly what they've done here. But believing on something, trusting something, relying on something to save you is completely different than doing all these works. So right away you can see that they believe a works-based salvation because... They're equating the gospel with being a disciple of Jesus Christ. But, you know, I, I preached a lot about that in John 15. I'm going to move on to the next point. They say, our Lord's words about eternal life were invariably accompanied by warnings to those who might be tempted to take salvation lightly. He taught that the cost of following him is high, that the way is narrow and few find it. He said, many who call him Lord will be forbidden from entering the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, they're equating a disciple with a believer. When they say that um, he taught the cost of following him is high. Yeah, the cost of following him is high. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to walk in his steps, if you're going to do the things that he did, sure, there's a high cost to that. That is not going to come easy. Because guess what Jesus did? A lot of great works. He did many wonderful works. He did the works of his father that had bidden him. All of the works that needed to be done, Jesus did them. And if we're going to follow him, guess what we need to do? We need to do the works. Now, if we need to follow him and do the works for our salvation, then you believe in a works-based salvation. Just come out and admit it. But they won't admit it. They will, they'll say, nope, we don't believe in works-based salvation because anyone in their right mind can clearly see that the Bible condemns that and, is in, and does not support a works-based salvation. But they try to repackage it and say, oh, it's not works-based salvation. But you have to be his disciple and do all of these works to be saved. But it's not works-based. And then they say, you know, that the way, so they're, they're, what they're doing is kind of fusing, they're also fusing different verses together. So you notice how he says that the, the cost of following him is high. Yeah, he says that in one place, but then he says that the way is narrow and few find it. Okay, he didn't talk about the cost of following him being high. In the same verse, he talked about, you know, many are not saved. Broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, destruction and, and many there be that go in there at, and few there are that are saved. Um, because narrow is the way. The reason why it's narrow is because it's only through Jesus Christ. That's narrow. He is the door. It's not some huge big RV gate. Jesus Christ is the door. It's a narrow way because it's only through him, not because it's difficult because you have to do all these works, which is what they're trying to imply with their statement. And ironically, the Lordship Salvation crowd that calls Jesus Lord are the ones that are saying, that are referencing Matthew 7. Turn to Matthew 7 real quick. They're referencing this in their statement. They say, he said many who call him Lord will be forbidden from entering the kingdom of heaven. And that's a, a clear reference to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. And, it, and it's so ironic that they, that they try to use this scripture. What does Matthew 7, 21 say? It says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Lordship salvation crowd, listen up. Because this is you who he's talking to. You call him Lord. And you think he has to be your Lord in order to be saved. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. See, this is what they're trusting in. I was a disciple of yours, Lord. Look at all the works that I did. Look, I went out and preached for you. I prayed. I read my Bible. I did all of this stuff, Lord. Look at all the works I did because you were my Lord, and I was obeying you. And what's he going to say? Verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You're trusting in your works? You've got a lot of iniquity to account for if that's what you're trusting in. And that's why they were cast out. And that's exactly what's going to happen to people who just have their faith in this lordship salvation. 
And I just, I just found it funny that they are even referencing that verse when it speaks so clearly against them. I'm going to keep reading. Here's another point that they make. Instead of calling men and women to surrender to Christ, modern evangelism asks them only to accept some basic facts about him. This is their argument. So they're saying instead of, instead of telling people, instead of telling men and women to surrender to Christ, Modern evangelism asks them only to accept some basic facts about him. Twofold, that th this, this statement is an error. And this, this is another great example that typifies so many false doctrines out there because they build these straw men that we don't even believe. And that'll be wrong. So th they, they use these half-truths and they mix them in with their lies to, to get people to swallow this stuff, right? So first they imply that one must surrender to Christ for salvation. So like you're saying, you're not telling people that they need to surrender to Christ as if it's just a foregone conclusion that you have to surrender to Christ to be saved. They're just saying like, you're not even telling people that. And they don't prove this anywhere from, from Scripture that you have to surrender to Christ. You know why they don't? You know why in this statement there was zero Scripture references? Because the word surrender is not even found in the Bible, not even one time. The word surrender is never used in the King James Bible. So then I was thinking, okay, well, maybe this is one of those things that the new translations use. You know, maybe this is one of those, one of those instances where they're getting this false doctrine from, um, from a new translation, which they do get it from that. But I was, I was looking to find that, you know, surrender to Christ verse. You, I couldn't find it. I didn't look up all the different false versions. I looked up like the ESV and the NIV, two of the more popular versions out there. I know it's not going to be in the New King James. So I couldn't even find it there. Now they did use the word surrender, but it was in the Old Testament for like battles when an army surrendered unto another, like a normal usage of the word. But never once used to even promote this concept that we have to surrender ourselves and just completely give up ourselves unto Christ as if we're giving him a gift instead of receiving the gift that he gave for us. And this is one of the things, this is one of the reasons why what they believe is so backwards. You, they, they think like you have to do something for him. You have to give yourself over to him. When John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's the one who gave, who, did, who does the giving. He's the giver of the free gift. We are the recipient of the free gift. It is not required of us to give of ourselves. We just need to receive it because it was given unto us. That's one of the reasons why they're so perverted and backwards. But so then the other thing that they do, besides saying, oh, you don't even tell people to surrender to Christ. Yeah, we don't tell them that because it's not scriptural. It's not in the Bible. It's not found anywhere that we have to surrender to Christ. But then they, they make this claim. Modern evangelism asks them only to accept some basic facts. About. Now, is that what we do when we go out soul winning is just say, okay, in order for you to be saved, you just have to accept some basic facts about Jesus. The fact, okay, fact one, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Fact two, Jesus Christ died for the world. Fact three, you know, he rose again from the dead. Now, do you believe that factual statement? Okay, you're saved. Is that, is, that, is that how we go out and try to win souls of Christ? No, because we don't believe that either. And they're trying to make it sound like this is what modern evangelism... Now, if anyone does that, I'm against that too. If it's just a matter of just accepting, of just, of just believing some basic facts. No, obviously the scripture talks about when you believe on, you're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you're not believing just on some facts about him. You're believing on him. You're trusting him to save you. You're calling out, as we read in Romans chapter 10, um, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're calling on him and asking him to save us. We're relying on him for salvation. That is what believing is. It's, it's just trusting him, relying on him, putting your faith on him. Say, Jesus did all the work. He paid for everything when he died on the cross. So I'm going to take my faith. Boom, it's right on Jesus Christ. It's not just on the fact that he was born of a virgin. It's not on these, these facts. I am literally trusting him to save me. I am trusting him with my soul to save me because he did all the work necessary for me. That is what believing is. And that's what we explain to people when you go out, when you go out and talk to them. There are so many people that will be in agreement over a lot of things that we talk about and say, yeah, okay, yeah, I believe that. But they're not willing to stake their fate on what Jesus did for them. They're not willing to just, to just put their trust only on him to be saved. 
A lot of people think, well, yeah, I mean, I believe he was born a virgin. I believe he died for the sins of the world. I believe this. I believe that. I believe these facts about Jesus. But I believe, you know, I got I to gotta do something too. That person isn't saved. We're not asking him just to accept some basic facts about, about the life of Jesus. We're asking him to, to convert their soul and put their faith on Jesus Christ to be saved. Huge difference. But they'll, they'll lump everyone together and just say, see, this is what, what they do. They just, they just ask people to, to, to believe some facts about Jesus instead of making them surrender their entire life to him. It's false. Watch out for that. <clears throat> So the next statement here, it says, to put it simply, the gospel call to faith presupposes that sinners must repent of their sin and yield to Christ's authority. This, in a nutshell, is what is commonly referred to as lordship salvation. This, in a nutshell, is completely heretical, and every one of their statements that they made is false and is not found in Scripture. When someone's telling you that we just presuppose something, look out for that too. Where is your evidence? Where you, you're just making an assumption about something. They say, well, this is all, all of this just presupposes that sinners must repent of their sin and yield to Christ's authority. Repent of their sins? We're going to get to that. So now they have all these, they have all these points. Like I said, there's no way I'm going to get through them. I don't even have all, I mean, there's, just, there's tons of pages here. I'll try to get through as many as I can, but it'll, it'll become apparent pretty quickly. So their first po major point on trying to defend Lordship salvation is they say that first, Scripture teaches that the gospel calls sinners to faith joined in oneness with repentance. Joined in oneness with repentance. So they give these Scripture references, and we'll go, we'll, we're going to look them up. Acts 2.38 so the, for their first statement is just saying that the gospel calls sinners to faith joined in oneness with repentance. So that basically that joined in oneness means that their faith and the repentance are joined together. That, that's, that those two are inseparable, that their faith and repentance, which, okay, I'm not going to spend too much time arguing that, but so they say Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's funny because they're using the same exact verse that the Pentecostals will use to try to say, well, you need to be baptized to be saved. Because he says, and, and they, they don't tell you, you know, verse 37. Verse 37 is a little bit more in context. It says, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? They were pricked in the heart. They heard about, they were the ones responsible for killing Jesus. Well, what should we do? What should we do about this? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay. All he said was repent and be baptized. Now, should we do that? Yeah, of course. But does John MacArthur then believe baptism is necessary for salvation too? If he's saying that repentance is... Is, is linked with that? Well, in this verse, he's talking about being baptized too. Acts 17.30, this is his next reference he gives. He says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay, it's just the usage of the word repent. And in all of these, you're going to notice, it just uses the word repent. It doesn't say... Repent of your sins to have everlasting life. It doesn't say any of those things. It's just, I mean, this is just verses that use the word repent. Commands you to repent. Okay. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Does that say for salvation? Does that say for anything other than God commands? I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me. I mean, if you're, if you're looking for a definition of repent, just to say, well, God commands everyone to repent. Well, yeah, if everybody's a sinner, he wants everyone to change. He wants everyone to, to not be a sinner, doesn't he? But is, is this verse saying that you have to repent in that sense to be saved? It doesn't say anything like that. It just says that God's commanding everyone to repent. But in context, verse 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So why is he commanding all men to repent? because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Mm -hmm. 
and there's going to be a, a judgment coming. So that's why he's asking everyone to repent. Um, next verse, verse 20, or chapter 20, verse, chapter Acts 20, verse 20 says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, okay, he's, he's testified, he showed them and taught them repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So what? What are you trying to prove here? You know, this is, and he says, repentance toward God, comma, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. To me, those look like two different things. They may or may not be, but, you know, trying to say that this scripture proves that it's just a oneness, that faith and repentance are always is just one, like they're inseparable. Um, not necessarily true. And then they use Second Peter 3. Actually, I'm, you know, I'm going to skip that because we're going to get on to repentance is a big point. And this is just all they said in that statement is that there's this oneness. They went to Second Peter 3, 9. It says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, again, in this in the context of that, it's talking about the day of the Lord. Okay, something that's gonna happen in the future. So again, when you look at it in context. Is this really talking about our salvation when it's talking about the day of the Lord? I mean, people all throughout history have died before the day of the Lord ever even came. And this is talking about the day of the Lord. So, um, but the next statement they make is really critical for understanding this doctrine because this is what it all relies on. They say, so first they said that the gospel calls sinners to faith, join in oneness with repentance. Repentance is a turning from sin. That consists not of a human work, but of a divinely bestowed grace. It is a change of heart, but genuine repentance will effect a change of behavior as well. So they say right off the bat, repentance is a turning from sin. That's what they define repentance as. Well, what about all the times that God repents in the Old Testament? Is God repenting of sin? Is God turning? Does God have sin that he needs to turn from? Is God someone that needs, oh, I need to turn from my sin? Jonah chapter 3 is a great example of this when it says that when God saw their works that they turned from their evil ways and he repented of the evil that he thought to do unto them. God repented in that verse. But it also describes people turning from their wicked ways as being works. And we've covered that so many times. I don't want to really, I don't even want to bother with turning that. But let's go to these verses that they claim supports their definition. They say, so they say, repentance is a turning from sin. And then in parentheses, Acts 3.19 and Luke 24.47. Turn, if you would, to Luke 24. I'll read Acts 3.19. So this is what they're saying when they say repentance is a turning from sin. What does Acts 3.19 say? He says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So does that saying, does that define repentance as turning from your sins? Turn from your sins therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. No. The only time sins mentioned there is that your sins are going to be blotted out. When you get saved, your sins are blotted out. You don't have to use the word repent. You could say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and your sins shall be blotted out. Because that's what the Bible says. When, when it's using the word repent here, it's not, it's not referencing what you're repenting of. He says, repent ye therefore and be converted. So they're using this statement to define repentance as a turning from sin when nothing is mentioned about turning from sin, just a mention saying that your sins will be forgiven. That's all it's saying. So when you get saved, your sins are forgiven. But this is not, not clearly stating anything about repentance being a turning from sin. But they found a verse that has repent and it has sin somewhere in there and they'll say, we'll just use this as a reference. So that the, the reader who's lazy and wants to read all this stuff that doesn't want to take the time to look up these references will just assume, oh, well, it says it in Acts 3.19. Luke 24, 
we'll get this in context. They, they reference 47, but we'll look at verse 46. It says, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Okay. So it tells us that it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. It's the gospel, right? Jesus Christ suffered. He rose again from the dead after the third, on the third day. And repentance. Now, remission of sins, what does that mean? It's forgiving of your sins, right? It's, it's the doing away with of your sins. That's what remission of sins means. So that both of these things should be preached in his name. Repentance and remission of sins. Does that say turning from your sins and remission of sins? Well, if you define repent as turning from your sins, I guess it does. But this does not support the claim that repentance is a turning from sin. And you see what they're doing? It's, it's real subtle, and I hope I'm, I'm being clear with this. But what they're, what they're doing is they're taking these, these two verses that if you kind of read over them real loosely, you could oh yeah, and the repentance and remission of sins, so that's turning from your sins. No. Repentance is, and just real briefly, look, repentance, the word repent by itself has nothing to do with sin. Nothing. The only way you could understand what you're repenting from or turning from is in the context that it's used. You can turn from all kinds of things. It doesn't even have to be sin. I was going to eat a chicken sandwich for lunch today, but I repented and had a ham sandwich. What does that have to do with sin? I changed my mind. I changed my course of action. I changed my mind. I changed what I wanted. There's nothing to do with sin, but, it, but it's a proper usage of the word repent. It doesn't mean I was sorry for that chicken, for that ham sandwich that wasn't being eaten, and I was so sorry for that ham sandwich that I repented and I just decided to take that sandwich. No. That's not what that means at all. The word repent can, is used because the word literally just means to change your mind about whatever you use it in context with. So to understand how repentance is used, you have to get it in context. And if it doesn't say in context, you can't just, like it doesn't here. It just says in that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. It doesn't tell you repentance from what. But we get that in other places of the scripture when it says repent and believe the gospel. Change what you believe and believe the gospel. Because both of them have to do with your belief. With your, you know, that's where you're changing. You're changing your belief. You'd repent, change, turn from something and believe the gospel. When you're believing in something false. Um, and that's evident. So they use that as the, those are their scripture references for, because I was interested to see, I was like, oh, what, what are they going to use? How are they going to tell me that repentance is turning from sin? Because I'd really like to see it. Those, those are it. I was kind of let down by that because <laughs> neither one of them define repentance at all. I mean, Jonah 3 does. Jonah 3.10, I think it is, of verse 10, that says they turned from their evil work. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. That's turning from your, that's, that's not defining repentance, but that is clearly saying turning from your evil way, which they're saying is turning from your sin, which they define as repentance. God defines that as works. But it's not a works-based salvation. And it's funny how they like to, to quote Acts so much. And you notice in a lot of these are quoting Acts. They quoted Acts 2, 38. They quoted Acts 3, 19. And then they quote... Um, Acts 11, 18, for um, God divinely bestowing grace. And I'm not even going to get into that point. And they're saying that it's a, a genuine change, a change of heart, but genuine repentance. I mean, if you really repented, it's going to affect the change of behavior as well. Um, they skip over this verse in Acts. Acts 19, 4 says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. What was that, that baptism of repentance? Well, he tells us, as we keep reading, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. That's the repentance he's talking about, that they believe on Jesus Christ. That is the repentance. That's the repentance necessary for salvation. No mention of sin. 
Just that they need to believe. So, uh, uh, and, and what they do, what they end up doing is equating believing, just believing. I mean, think about the word believe. It's not a very hard, a difficult word to understand. Believe. What do you believe? I believe this. What is a belief? Something you hold to as true, right? It's a belief. It's, it's a belief system or a belief that you have. It's something that you think. What is that word again? Think is true, right? You believe is the things that you think. A belief isn't an action. It isn't a work. A belief is something that's a thought. It's, it's a belief. It's something you believe either in your heart or in your mind, whatever you want to say, however you want to define it. You believe something to be true. You think something is true. That's your belief. It's not a work. But their definition, apparently, of belief is that, well, you have to forsake all that you have. You have to follow Christ. You have to do all these things. And if you don't do those things, then, you, then you're not a believer. You don't believe. Completely destroying what these words even mean and, and a complete misunderstanding of the English language and trying to make words mean something that they don't. So they say that genuine repentance will change your behavior. They, they go to, turn to Luke 3. We're going to see what they, what they mean by that. Because they, um, they reference Luke 3.8 as their text verse for that. We're going to start reading in verse 7. Again, we want to get these things in context. Verse 7 says, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, this is, uh, this is John the Baptist. He's in the wilderness. He's baptizing. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Again, and when we go into further context and compare it with the other, with the other um, Gospels, who is he talking to? The generation of vipers. He's talking to the Pharisees that came out to see what he was doing and to see his baptism and to hear what he was saying. And he was calling out to them. And these Pharisees, are the, the same Pharisees are the ones that, that killed Jesus Christ, that were reprobate, that were snakes, that were vipers, that didn't bring forth good fruit. They were evil trees that brought forth evil and corrupt fruit. They were bringing forth children of hell that were twofold more child of hell than themselves. They were making proselytes of, of, in that manner because they were reparate. They were false prophets. This is who John was talking to. And that's why he tells, he says unto them, understanding who he's talking to in this, in this reference is important when he says, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. So he's asking them, okay, if you really believe this, you know, I want you to show it to me. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. That is not saying that true repentance will always bring forth the fruit, which is what they're claiming, a change of behavior. That's what they're claiming that that's that one statement means when he was talking to the vipers, when he was talking to the false prophets, that all people who believe or repent or whatever are, gonna, are definitely going to have a change of behavior. <clears throat> and they also quoted Acts 26, 18 through 20 as their other proof text for genuine repentance will definitely change people's behavior. They say in Acts 26, 18 says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So, if true repentance is going to automatically you will just do the works then. If you truly repented, then why did Paul have to be, have to even teach them and tell them to do the works that are meet for repentance? Why did he even have to say that if it's an automatic foregone conclusion, which is what they're claiming, right? If, if a person truly repents and they believe on Jesus Christ in their mind, if, if I just turn from all my sins, if I make Christ the Lord of my life and that's how I get saved, why would I even need anybody to tell me 
that I need to do works meet for repentance because it's going to happen automatically. It's already going to be there. It doesn't make sense. But that's what they're, this is their proof text. And because Paul said that they should repent and turn to God, which is true, that is something that they should do. They should repent. They should turn to God. They should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and do works meet for repentance. Well, that's also what we do. We tell people the same thing. Hey, you need to believe on Christ. You need to put your faith in Him. You're, you, you believe on Him? Amen, you're saved. Good, great. Okay, well now you need to do works. Let's go out. Let's come to church. You know, go out soul winning with me. Do everything right. Do the things that you're supposed to be doing. Do your works. Meet for the repentance. I mean, you, you, you put your faith in Christ. Now let's start doing the work. Start showing that you put your faith in Christ. Believe, you know, Try, try make it evident. But it doesn't mean that you, that you have to do those things in order to be saved. And it doesn't mean that if someone chooses not to do those things that they're not saved. Because we still have our free will. Yes, we have a new spirit and that new spirit is a new creature. And, and old things have passed away and all things have become new for that creature. But it does not mean that we are um, automatically going to do those things, which is what they're saying. So, um, here's their second point. So, I'm, I don't even think I'm going to get past like, the second point tonight. But, um, let's look at their second point. They say, Scripture teaches that salvation is all God's work. Those who believe are saved utterly apart from any effort on their own. And they say, Titus 3.5. So it's a, they say that because Titus 3.5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost. That, um, and that's true. I mean, those who believe are not saved from our efforts, but it depends on if they're saying believing on Christ is an effort or not. I, mean, it's, I don't think it is an effort. I don't think it's, it's a work that we do. But then they say even faith is a gift of God not a work of man. And now, now they're starting to get into this Calvinistic doctrine saying that, you know, faith is a gift of God, that no man can even put their faith in Christ unless it was given to him by God. And that um, essentially this is how the Calvinists work into the predestination and saying God picks and chooses who gets saved because to some people he gives the ability, the, this grace to be able to put their faith in Christ and other people don't get that from God, which is, again is another heresy. Um, this is, but this is the way that they're leaning. And, um, but what they say here next, they say real faith therefore cannot be defective or short-lived, but endures forever. So they're saying if you have real faith, it cannot be defective. Meaning you can't ever, uh, I mean, I, I guess that means you can't ever stray. It can't be short-lived, but endures forever. And they use Philippians 1.6 as a proof for that, Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Again, is this saying anything about your belief? Is this saying anything really about the works that you do? This just says that the, the same person, God, who has begun a good work in you, God began a good work in you when you were born again, when you have that new spirit. He began that work in you and he says he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You're going to get redeemed. A full redemption is when you get the, your new body with your new spirit. That is the, the, the day of Jesus Christ is when you're going to get that new body. And that is going to be the completing, the completion of the work that he started when you got saved, when you got sealed with the Holy Ghost, when you got that new spirit. You're not complete yet. We're saved. We have a new spirit, but we're not complete yet. We are not going to be complete until the day of Christ when we get our new body. Then that work will be completed. Right now, we're an uncompleted work. And it says here, all he's saying is that um, he's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That that work then will be completed. Um, again, not. I don't know what that has to do with a defective or short-lived faith. That's not. Um, that's not what that verse is talking about at all. The third point. They say Scripture teaches that the object of faith is Christ Himself, not a creed or a promise. And they say John three sixteen for that. 
um, okay, I have no problems with that. The object of faith is Christ himself. Of course, he is the object of that. That is where, where we need to place our faith on. Then they say, faith, therefore, involves personal commitment to Christ. So first they say something that's true. Okay, well, yeah, Jesus Christ is the object. But then they say, faith, therefore, because of this, and it, which doesn't make any sense. Again, logically, this doesn't even make any sense. Scripture teaches that the object of faith is Christ himself. So because Christ is the object of our faith, they're saying faith, therefore, involves personal commitment to Christ, that we have to commit ourselves unto him because he's the object. It doesn't follow. It doesn't, it doesn't even make any sense. It's, it's, not a, it's not a logical train of thought there. And then they say, in other words, all true believers follow Jesus. Now, what they're saying there is that a personal commitment is faith. Basically, that's what they're saying. That, that faith in Jesus is a personal commitment to Christ. That that's, those two are, are equivocal. That they're the same thing. Well, I thought God's the one that gave not us that gives. Again, making a commitment, you're giving yourself to him. You're giving your time. You're giving your, your you know, everything, your will, everything that you have, you're giving unto him. Which, is that a bad thing to do? No, it's a good thing to do. But is that what's required for salvation? Absolutely not. We need to receive the free gift. We're not giving ourselves. And they quote John 3, 16, where they reference it. If they would read it, they would see that. So their, their reference, though, for faith, therefore, involves personal commitment to Christ is 2 Corinthians 5.15, which says, In that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And that's their, their reference verse. But if we keep reading, it says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is what this verse is talking about. He says, what is he saying? He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Does this say they will not live henceforth unto themselves? Because that's what they're teaching. They're saying if you have true faith, you will not live unto yourself. You will live for Christ. You have given him a personal commitment and that is what you're going to do. No, it says we should not. Should we live under ourselves? No, we should live under Christ, of course. But is that saying that we definitely, if we have faith in him, then there's no way that we won't live under ourselves? No, that's not what that's saying at all. They're just, they're twisting scripture and they're trying to force their, their false doctrine, their false gospel into scripture. And this is the verse that goes on and I'm going to probably, I'm almost done. This is what so many people like to turn to and say, oh, see, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not living different than you were before, then you weren't truly saved. And they'll point to this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So they're saying, see, if there's not something new in your nice life, then you're, you're not saved. Well, when old things are passed away, what you, you, well, when you have that new creature, yeah, that new creature is born inside of you. But it says all things are become new. So if they're saying, well, all only means some, no, all means all. Old things are passed away. That's going to be all old things, right? And then all things are become new. So if we're going to interpret this verse the way that they do, then you would have to say, you don't just have a small change, you have all things have become new. Right? You're doing all things new. And if your old things are passed away, you're never going to go back to those old things again. So if you ever, if you were a sinner, if you were drunk, if you smoked cigarettes, if you did any of these things before, but now you're saved, now you have that new creature, well, all those old things need to be gone. You can never tell a lie again. You can, all, all the sins you've ever committed, if we're going to uh, interpret this verse the way that they interpret it. And what they fail to realize is that the new creature is not the same as your flesh. We still have the flesh which causes us to sin. The flesh is unchanged. The flesh still wants to do the things of the flesh. The only difference now is we have a new creature. We have a new creature inside of us. Hey, all things are new to the new creature. Those old things are passed away. That new creature is brand new. 
That new creature wants to do good things. It wants to do what's right. It does not want to follow the, the, the ways of the flesh. And then they also used, they said, in other words, all true believers follow Jesus. And they say John 10, 27 through 28 is the reference for that. And John 10, 27, 28 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, I've said this before, but when you're forming doctrine, when your only scriptural evidence is a parable, is very foolish. And this is the only reference they gave for that. And this is a parable in John 10 where Jesus, and we went through this in our, in our series, where Jesus is saying that my sheep hear my voice. You know, I'm the good shepherd and I have these sheep and I have sheep in another fold and I'm the door and he goes through all this stuff and he's talking about a parable. So in his parable, he's talking about leading sheep and he's saying, okay, when I'm leading sheep, you know, they hear me, they know my voice, I know them and they follow me. And he's using a reference of sheep. And I mean, you have to remember that that's a physical reference of, of a shepherd and, their sh and his sheep. And, and sheep that know the shepherd's voice and follow him. He's, he's trying to get you to understand some basic concept, which is why he uses a parable. And they're trying to say, well, see, because in this parable it says my sheep follow me, that means that, that all true believers, you imperatively, you must follow Jesus all the time, otherwise you're not saved. Which is stupid. Because what happens when you sin? Are you following Jesus? I mean, if you're sinning, that's Jesus didn't sin. As soon as you sin, then, then you're no longer following him. Well, but you, but you do follow him if you're saved, right? According to them, according to his lordship salvation. It's nonsense. There's one more thing I want to get to and we'll, be, and we'll call it a night. There's so many references to, to disciples and being a disciple of Christ. It's all throughout their, their, their doctrine of what they believe. Um, let's see, I'll read for you number, their fourth thing. There's like seven or nine of these or something. We're, we're not getting through them. The fourth thing says, Scripture teaches that real faith inevitably produces a changed life. Okay, yeah, well, this, is, this is the section I'll get to and we'll be done. So, and it inevitably it produces a changed life. And they reference 2 Corinthians 5.17, which we just read. You know, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay, in the sense that we have a new creature, sure, there's a changed life in that regard that you have a new creature now. But not in the way that they're trying to say. Then it says salvation includes a transformation of the inner person. And they say Galatians 2.20, which is, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, it's not a transformation of the inner person, it's a new birth. So they're trying to say there's a transformation going on at salvation, but it's not. And that's, and that's where they're getting confused, I think, is that they're confusing your flesh being transformed with just a brand new creature of an inner man. Um, because it's not a transformation, it's a, it's, a, it's a new person. The nature of the Christian is new and different. Okay, and they say Romans 6.6 6 for that. And then the unbroken pattern of sin and enmity with God will not continue when a person is born again. So they're saying that, I guess now they're saying that you, you have a broken pattern of sin and enmity of God. But then they quote 1 John 3 verses 9 and 10 to support their statement here that where they say the unbroken pattern of sin and enemy will, with God will not continue when, the person is born, when a person is born again. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close it with this, with this passage because this is a gross misunderstanding of 1 John in general. 1 John, and I preach about this when I preach about the new man, but 1 John 3, 9 says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. If they're going to start using these verses to see, they, they apply it lightly. But they're still trying to apply this to the Christian. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 
In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. It's funny because they'll say that the unbroken pattern of sin and enemy will not continue when a person is born again. But they won't say that a person won't sin, which is exactly what this passage is saying. They try to light, soften up and, and basically are saying like, well, see, if a person is saved, then, I mean, something's going to be different. Because this verse says that, you know, whosoever is born of God is, does not commit sin. So if this is saying that you don't commit sin, well, at least, I mean, you should clean up something about your life. We ought to see some evidence of that. They don't know, they don't understand the verse at all because they're not saved. They don't understand what this is talking about. I mean, in, in order to apply it the way that they're applying it, you have to take it for what it says and say, okay, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The, version, the way that they're interpreting that would mean that in order for a person to truly be saved, they can no longer commit any more sins. Otherwise, if you do, that's evidence that you're not saved. But this is not, this is not what they... They obviously don't believe that because that would be silly because they know everybody sins. We're all sinners. And this crowd doesn't believe in sinless perfection, I don't think. Um, that's a whole other false doctrine. But very simply, this is talking about your new creature that doesn't commit sin. It's the new man. And when you walk in the spirit, when you walk in the new man, you don't commit sin. And when you walk in the flesh, you do commit sin. It's that simple. And um, it goes on and on here. Um, it's I almost feel like it's a way it's not a waste of time there's so many people deceived by this but I mean I, I spent too much time on this I think just even and I didn't even like write down any notes I was just copying and pasting scriptures I was just saying okay here's the reference and just copying and pasting and putting in here this is what they're claiming this is what they're claiming and as I was copying and pasting I was reading it and it's like none of these references that they're using are what the verses mean at all they're just, they're just putting some stuff together. And really, I think what they're counting on is that people are going to read this and say, oh, okay, well, yeah, that's in the Bible because they have all these references. Yeah. And they're just going to read their false doctrine and they're going to read it all the way through. And they're going to say, oh, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. So Scripture teaches that genuine believers may stumble and fall, but they will persevere in the faith. Now, I'll, I'll close it with this. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy 2 because it's important that you see this verse. It's important that you see this Scripture reference. Because this is in the Bible. And the things that they just make claims about contradict what the Bible actually says. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we get this question out all the time about soul winning, what people will say. And, and, and it comes from people who are using their brains and they're thinking about stuff. And they'll say, okay, the Bible says if we believe we have eternal life, well, what if you stop believing? Right? What if, what if you do that? Do you still have eternal life or not? I, mean, I mentioned this earlier. But it's a good question. But the Bible actually has the answer because this question is answered specifically. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 11. We'll read it in context. It says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we, believe, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So of these things, we need to put them in remembrance and that we don't strive about words to no profit. These people who, who are claiming in this lordship salvation are often striving about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. They're trying to get you to doubt your salvation or make you think you weren't really saved when you put your faith and trust on the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul because they'll say, oh, look, you're, you're in sin. You must not be saved. And this is the people who get puffed up in their minds thinking that they're better than everybody else because they're living such a righteous life and you're not and they could point the finger at you. Now, 
It's said right there in verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. The reason why we're still saved is that God has sealed us. He has put the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Holy Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are saved, that we are the children of God. Our, you know, we have His Spirit inside of us. And even if our spirit were to say that we don't believe, the Holy Spirit can't say that. The Holy Spirit can't say um, He cannot deny Himself. And God is faithful, which means that God is true. When God makes a promise, He won't go back on that promise. We can trust Him. God does not lie. So when God is faithful and He says, you have been sealed with the, with the, with the earnest of the Holy Spirit, with, the, with that spirit of promise, you have eternal life. I've sealed you now because you believe. Once he does that, he doesn't go back on his word, even if you go back on your word. We're human. We have a sinful flesh. If we, go, if we make a promise or a vow, and then we go back on that, which happens all the time. I mean, people getting divorced left and right. They make vows to their spouse that they're only going to be with them till death do us part. And then, oh, I changed my mind. We're getting divorced. Men can go back on their words. God never goes back on his word. So once he makes a promise like Jesus did in, five, in John 5, 24, he says, you shall not come into condemnation. You've passed from death unto life. That promise is true. And um, even if we stop believing, that's not evidence that you were never saved. God is still faithful. If you put your faith in him, he's faithful and true to keep his promise. It, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're saved by being obedient and having an obedient faith and keeping up these works and all this other stuff. Because, again, if, you, if, if a person tries to claim that you need to have this, this, this enduring faith, right, continuing faith, well, what happens when you don't have works? That faith is dead. So what, the, what they're going to be saying is that if you, don't, if you don't continue with your works, then you are never saved. And that's heresy. It's flat out. That's just, that's just flat out heresy. It, it goes against everything that the Bible says. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Don't let these people try to, try to twist you around or subvert your, your faith or subvert your... your um, you your doubt your salvation because they've perverted the gospel and twisted it. And any time someone tries to teach you a doctrine or show you a doctrine from the Bible, don't just trust some references, whether you read it, whether it's spoken, whatever it is. Don't just accept it as truth. Look it up for yourself and say, are these verses really supporting what they're telling me or not? Is this, is this really legitimate? Because if you do that, like on this website I did it, with this Lordship Salvation garbage, not, I, okay, I don't want to say not one. There was maybe one or two verses that actually were saying what they were claiming, but those are things that we already believe anyways. Those were the little nuggets of truth that they mix into their false doctrine to try to, again, make it more acceptable to people. They have to have some kind of, of legitimacy and truth. And that's why they'll say it's not, of, it's not of works. We don't believe in salvation by works because that's exactly what they're trying to get you to believe is a works-based salvation. But they lie to you and say that that's not what it is. To get your guard down. Say, oh, well, yeah, they don't believe in works, but wait. I have to be obedient. I have to give myself to Christ. He has to be my Lord. I have to do everything he says or else I'm not saved. That's what they believe. Anyways, let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for um, giving us the Holy Spirit to help guide us in all wisdom and all truth, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us not to be troubled by any of these false prophets that are out there that espouse to this, this, this belief of lordship salvation that's basically just a, a different way of packaging work salvation, dear Lord. We know that you've given us a free gift and we love you for that. We thank you for that, dear God. And we know that we should do all the good works and that is something that you want us to do, that you demand us to do, but we know that that has zero impact on our salvation, that our salvation comes completely and 100% by just trusting Jesus Christ to save our souls since he paid for our sins, since he's the one that suffered and bled and died for us. 
in that our faith is completely on Him to save us, not in works of righteousness which we have done, but according to your mercy, you've saved us, dear God, and we, and we love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.